Shall we bow head for a word of prayer? Father God, as we come to worship you this morning, and we come from wherever we are, may your blessing be with us, grant us your mercy and grace, and bless our worship. For we pray all this in Jesus' name, Amen.
Okay, children, wherever you are, this Sabbath we are going to have another children's story for you. So put your attention to the screen at the front of you right now. I know many of us are aware, like uh, there are so many screen time, but today the pastor said you can watch the screen. So we will have a children's story, and I hope that it, this will bring a blessing to all of us. Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Praying that everything is well with you all. Hmm. Have you been in a situation where you had to make a bold decision between standing for the truth or rather follow the norm? Will you choose to glorify God or choose not to? I can't wait to tell you today's story. Our story today is about Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar was a ruler of all Babylon. Everyone had to do what he said. If he made a rule, then everyone had to obey it. He did not obey God. He worshipped idols. He had his servants make a large golden idol. It was almost 30 meters high and 3 meters wide. He gathered all the officials of the court together and also a band. King Nebuchadnezzar made the law for all of the people. Whenever you hear the music playing, you must all bow down and worship the idol. If anyone does not bow down, and then they will be put to death by being thrown into the furnace of fire. Later, when the music began playing, all of the people bowed down, all except for these three people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They did not bow down to an idol like everyone else. They knew that God only wanted them to worship him. God's law said that they were to never bow down to an idol. They knew that they would get in trouble with the king and that everyone might laugh, but they still choose to obey God. Some astrologers in the king's court noticed that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down to an idol. They went and told the king that someone had dared to disobey the king's law. King Nebuchadnezzar was very angry. How dare anyone in his kingdom not worship his gods? He called the three young men before him. Why will you not bow down before the idol? As I commanded, if you do not bow down to my idol immediately, then I will have you thrown into the blazing furnace of fire. King said angrily to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, We don't have to explain to you, they answered. We will never bow down to any, anyone but the Lord God. He is the only true God. If you throw us into the fairy furnace, then our God will save us. Even if he let us die, we would still love him and not worship your false gods. The king was furious. He told some of his strongest soldiers to tie Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the fire. He ordered the fairy furnace to make seven times hotter than normal. The fire was so hot that the soldiers died when they threw the men into the furnace. Then an amazing thing happened. King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire and saw four men inside the furnace. Even though the fire in the furnace was burning and it was hot, the men were just walking around inside. The king looked up in amazement and said, Weren't there three men thrown in the fire? Oh yes, king, there were only three men answered the advisor. No one knew where the men were alive and no one knew how there could be four men. The fourth man looked different. King Nebuchadnezzar th wrongly thought that he was a god. Maybe the man was an angel or maybe it was the presence of the Lord God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the furnace, yelled the king. 
the three men walked out of the fire. They were unhurt and their clothes were not burned. Everyone noticed that the men didn't even smell smoke. It was a miracle. King Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No other God can save men in this way. The king ordered that no one in the kingdom ever say bad about God, the Lord God. Then he gave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego even better jobs in the kingdom of Babylon. That's the end of our story. These three young people managed to stay strong even though they are in a tough situation because God is with them. May God be with us always. This is my prayer. This morning, our sermon is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 19. And we have heard the verse actually just now being said through the special song that we had. And so I will go forward and go straight right away to the sermon itself. And I would like to invite all of us to give our attention to the message that we will have this Sabbath morning. Now, for most of us who had been in church for all this time, I have shared with you many things about my childhood, but there is one thing that I can still share with all of us, and that was my preschool days. I remember during the time when I was still quite young, probably when I was six or probably seven, uh, just a bit after preschool days, I guess, I received, if I can say, my first existen ex existential question. It just so happened that I was sitting in my living room back in Indonesia, and I started to have this thought about what, will, what, what it will be if I do not exist. How does the world will look like? Will there be anything different? And how does it feel to be a non-existent being? And from that question onwards, I start to ask about many other questions. For example, I started to ask about the existence of God. And I start to ask, how do we know that God is the way that we see from the Bible? Yes, I was seven years old and I had all these questions with me. And so I started to ask this question to the people around me. I started to ask this question to, to my parents, to my teacher, to my pastor. And of course back then, to have a seven years old boy asking such a deep philosophical question is something that was quite unexpected. They were a bit like, oh, okay, you, sh you should talk about um, you know, all those, why that superhero exists, or why um, we eat this food this morning, but why you even have to ask an existential question, something that is so philosophical. But that was the question that I had back then. I was asking this question because I do wonder, how does it look like to be not existing in this universe? And I wonder whether the universe that we know as we know it today is the only universe that we are aware of. Or probably there is another dimension that we are not aware of. Or probably there are universe that is beyond what we can see, what we can touch, and what we can feel. How do we know that God exists the way God exists in the Bible? What is the form of God? How does God look like? Does He have beard like me? Or He looks like me? Or all these questions. And so, when I was young, and I started to ask all these questions, some people around me start to find that, hey, it is too young for you to ask, to ask such questions. Or they started to think that I probably have lost my faith in such an early age, that I couldn't discover faith anymore in church. And so my question back then was considered as someone who had been a troublemaker. I asked too many questions, and oftentimes people like me who has all this uncomfortable, disturbing question about faith, about religion, about what we believe, about the church, and so on and so forth. We are considered as troublemaker. We are counted as someone that is 
doing and asking too many questions that is unnecessary. And so back then, many of these questions were not answered. And fortunately enough, if I can say, my parents really so-called like to bring us to the library. I remember growing up, while I have all these questions with me, I, they may not have the full answer. And one thing that I appreciate from them is this, that they never dismissed my question. The people in church that back then may dismiss the question and think like, oh, you know, your son asked too many questions that is too deep. But my parents, I don't know why, for some reason, they entertain these questions even though they do not have the answer. And so what did they do? They sent me to the library. So I was spared by the library. Every week, at least two to three times, my parents will bring me to the library. And I can stay there for hours looking for all books. And it is interesting to know that not only me, two of my sisters also, we enjoy library very much. We will browse every single book in the library. We will read about dinosaur. We will read about UFO. We will read about science. We will read about uh, geology. We will read about geography. We will read about sports. We will read all kind of things. And somehow, some of the answers that I were looking for, I was looking for, was found in the library. But this is the problem. Because most of the books in the library are written by secular writers who may not necessarily share Christian worldview. And so I started to wonder, for example, when I read books about geology, and of course for those of us who are also reading geology and uh, all these things about stones and how uh, coal were, were developed in the soil and so on and so forth, suddenly I start to read and say that, hey, all these books said that the world, the earth that we have today was a process of a long, long uh, period of time in which all this sedimentation, all these layers of, um, of soil that we have built upon the previous soil that came probably about millions of years ago. And so I started to wonder and I started to question the church stand on our idea or what we teach in the church about creation. I started to read books about dinosaur. And in those books, you know, the writer will say that dinosaur exists millions of years ago during a period that is beyond what we are understanding in the Bible. Cretaceous, Jurassic, all this word that you probably have heard before, all this period of time in which such scientists suggest that this is the time when the dinosaur evolved from some simple form of organism into a complex form of being, and now finally we have humanity as we evolve today. So I started to wonder whether the teaching of the Bible started uh, really, really the truth, or whether now I have to rely on science, where it seems, the book seems to say that we are here, we exist because of some form of evolution. It's all just a coincidence. Now, I do not know whether it happens to your family as well. But one thing for sure, my son started to ask similar types of questions. He started to come and ask me, Dad, you know, in the science book that I read, it said that this dinosaur exists. But the, the science said, the books, the scientific book said that they exist about three to four million years ago. And right now he is six. And I, part of me feel a bit proud to know that he asked the same question like I asked when I was his age. But at the same time, I realized as well the struggle that my parents had when I was asking that question to him, to them. And we are living in this world of today where our young people are not limited in their search for information anymore. Back then in my time, I have to travel to the library to read all these books. But for the younger generation of today, 
They don't even have to move from their house. All that they need to go to do is to just Google it, or they will go to Wikipedia. And some of these ans- uh, this, the, the answer of their questions seems to be there. But when they come to the church and asking similar questions, oftentimes we give them an opposite response. Probably we still stuck with this idea that when our young people are giving us or having this question to us, it's a sign or it's a symptom of their starting to lose their faith. But today as we're going to explore together in this topic that we are going to have today, I think for many of them, like I was back then, it is probably not that because we are losing our faith, but rather because we are trying to make our faith sensible. Because beyond the curiosity that we have, I wonder really that whether the teaching of, our, of the Bible really makes sense when it comes to the reality of this world. We are living in this world of today where such question becomes something that is very important for many of, young, of our young people. They were educated for many of us in a non-Christian schools. For them, they have to go to a non-Adventist universities. And over there, they were given all this teaching that may not necessarily in line with what we teach as a church. And when they come with such questions, probably they are also wondering, how can I make sense over the question that I have while, one, while growing up in church and looking at the reality outside and it seems like it doesn't match anymore. And so as I look upon the struggles that many of our young people had, one thing that I do find is that there are at least three questions that they have that oftentimes we may miss it or probably we do not dare to tackle these questions. The first one is the question is that who am I? For many of them, we are searching for our identity. And from there, we ask the second question, where do I fit? They are searching for the sense of belonging. They are focusing on their community. And the third one will be, what difference do I make? They are searching for purpose. They are searching for the reason why they exist, why they are who they are, with their personality, with their gift, and all the things that are surrounding them. And upon this three questions, we will explore together, and we shall start from the first one, and that is to find identity. Now, in the past, for many of us who grew up probably in the previous years, or somewhere back in the 60s or 70s, or even way back to the 40s, oftentimes we only have two forms of identities. Number one is the family identity. We are being identified, because of who we are and to which family that we are born to. And so that's the reason why, you know, family tree, who you are, who is your father, who is your mother, uh, all those things are very important back then. And the second identity that all of us possess is spiritual identity. Which faith do you belong to? And oftentimes these are the two identity that we are carrying all the way until the day we die. But as you realize, in this modern world of today, it's, not long, it's no longer that way. For many of our young people, even our young adults and young families, they have so many identities that they have to be identified for. For example, number one, they still have to have their family identity. Number two, they still have to have their spiritual identity, their faith. But then there are many more identities that they have to carry with them. For example, educational identity. A lot of young people today, they are struggling with this educational identity. They are struggling, especially for those of us who are here in Singapore, you know how competitive it is and how privileged it is for some of them to enter into a prestigious school. So now, which school they went to is also something that is very important for them to be identified with. What degree that they obtain? You know, many times, young people come to me and um, 
And, you know, they share, oh, pastor, which major that should I take? And many of them said that they, they want to take art. They want to take dancing. They want to take archaeology. They want to take all this so-called fancy degree. But then their parents said, oh, why you want to take that degree? Those degrees are very, very useless. It brings no money. You know, why you want to take archaeology? For what? Especially in Singapore, where you got job for archaeologists? No such thing. They want to take dancing. And they said, oh, why, why, why you want to take dancing? No such thing will ever exist in Singapore. You know, why you want to take dancing? Go and take law. Go and take medicine. Go and take business. Something that will bring money. And so for many of them, now the degree that they obtain is something that they will carry all their life. And I am privileged enough to encounter one, one young, young adult um, before. And I asked her, hey, so I heard that you are studying overseas. What degree did you take? And she proudly mentioned, oh, I took a degree in archaeology, specializing in Chinese ancient pottery. I was like, wow, this is such a unique degree. And when she shared that degree with some of the church members around her that day, you know what was the reaction of some of the aunties, some, huh? not all aunties, some of the aunties, they said, I, uh, why you take such a no-point degree? You know, why you take ancient Chinese pottery? What for? It's not going to bring you money and stuff. And fortunately enough, if I can say, some of these assessments were proven to be wrong. She is now one of the top researchers in one of the China universities studying what? Ancient Chinese pottery. But here you go. They are struggling with identity. Not only which school they went to, what degree that they obtained is now very important. Then after you take the degree, it's not end there. What comes next? People ask, what grades did you obtain? Did you take honor or not? Did you uh, graduate with honor? Did you grad graduate with merit? Or you just uh, graduate? No, de no honor degree at all. You are honorless. And then, what honor did you earn? And then afterward, after you get your degree, what will be the second identity that they need to uh, identify themselves with? What is your job? What company do you work in? Is it a MNC, multinational company? Or is it just a local company? Or even is it just some unknown company that nobody knows? They don't even have a website. They don't even have a phone number. And then they have to struggle with the identity of how much is their salary? What position do you hold? Are you just a clerk? Or you are senior manager and so on and so forth? And then after work, after they get their job, what will be the next one? They will be asked about their material identity. What kind of house do you live in? What type of car do you drive? What kind of smartphone do you use? And social identity, finally. Who is your friend? What do you do on Saturday night? Where do you go to hang around after work studies? You know, our, our young people and our young adults today are struggling with so many identities being placed in them. And you may say, oh, why do you have to be bothered with all those identities? You know, just believe in God and work in faith. If I have to be honest with all of us, even some of us in church, we are so driven to see our child will be successful outside of the church. We are very concerned whether they will survive in Singapore. We do whatever it takes so they can go to prestigious universities. We want to make sure that they will get a good job. We want to make sure that they have a good friend. We want to make sure even some of us that they will have enough things in their pocket so they can be comfortable enough to be identified as someone that is good enough in life. The day when your identity is just being identified by your family and by your faith has long gone. And with this crisis of identity that many of them are struggling, many times they have to face two things. Number one is they will have identity crisis. And number two, they will have immense stress. Because of all this pressure that they have to undergo in life, sometimes it's just 
difficult for them to identify themselves with the church. And oftentimes, when we, they come with this identity crisis to the church, we respond in this way. Number one, that we oftentimes we take and say to them, if you are not with us, you are against us. If you're not living up into the faith that we believe, if you not behave in the way that the church behaves, you're not part of us. Or sometimes we also go and even tell them, how do you not even know about such thing? You have been growing up in church. You know, we, di- we even did that test. I remember some of them were, uh, were, to- were, were telling me they were brought in front and they were tested over their fundamental belief. And it's such an embarrassing thing to do, I believe, that they have to come forward and they were tested and asked all those Adventist fundamental beliefs. And they already come with their identity crisis and now they are being humiliated in front of everyone that they do not know the fundamental belief of the church. And we expect them to stay in church after we humiliate them. And number two, when it comes to the immense stress, when they are so stressed, with all these demands of the world that sometimes even us as Christian parents, we put in them. The response that we gave to them was, what a spoiled generation you are. Back in the day when I was your age, my life was much harder, but I didn't complain. That is usually the way we respond to them. Oh, such a strawberry generation, such a spoiled group. You know, you... You know, small things also cry. Small things also complain. Now, I was tempted to do the same, knowing that back in Indonesia, I was even placed in a gangster high school for a while. And when some of these young people in church came to me and said, oh, Pastor, you know, um, don't walk there because we know there will be a gangster there. And I, I told them, I, in my mind, I almost said like, I, uh, you all, it's just normal people. Huh? You know, if, if, if in my time, those people are, I will beat them up. But then I realize, when I'm saying those things, what the message did I send to them? That their stress, their concern are not validated. That we simply tell them that, oh, you are such a spoiled people. Grow up. Take, you'll be stronger. How come you, those small things also you cannot do? And forgetting that we are not extending the empathy and the sympathy of Jesus to many of them. Or sometimes we even blame them. And we say, oh, it is because of you playing cell phone too much. That's why when uh, pastor preach, I notice that you are using your cell phone and play games. That's why now you are cursed. And so on and so forth. Yes, it's probably true that they shouldn't... um, watch their cell phone, even right now while I'm preaching, hey, young people, please don't watch your cell phone or play game, all right? But I will not blame you and say that, oh, because of that, because of you don't do this and that, that you are in such situation. Because by doing so, we may have missed the opportunity to extend the love of Jesus for them. Number two is the sense of belonging. In the world that they are living today, you may wonder why they are so hooked into social media. Why they are so hooked into all types of media. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And now even I am so uh, confused, if I can say, with this um, app called TikTok. How many of you are playing TikTok? I'm not sure. But I know that many of our young people are so used to this TikTok app. You know, I start to watch, I was like, ah, yeah. It's, it's interesting, but it's really not for me. But then you may wonder why are they so hooked into all these social media? And the answer is simple. They're searching for connection. They're looking for a deep, personal, social connection with someone. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. How many of us are related to our young people today. And I'm not talking about the question about you just say hi to them and how are you and that's it. But you are really, really there and talk to them face to face and heart to heart. You really know who they are inside out. 
You really know who they are as a person. You really know them as people. And so this question that I have for you is that how you really know them? Because oftentimes we have this misconception that in order for, that, for us to relate with them is that you need to be like them. You dress like them, speak like them, eat like them, and so on and so forth. You know, when they go out and eat pizza, you have to eat the pizza as well. But for them, it's okay because they are still young. But for us, we are worried that it will increase our cholesterol report on the next health screening that we will have. So sometimes we are wondering, oh, do I have to dress with them? I will look so awkward if I dress like the young people. But not, I have to tell you today, that you don't have to dress like them. You don't even have to eat their food in order for, them, for you to relate with them. Sometimes we think that to relate to our young people, we need to approve all the things that they do without reservation. They want to do this, ah, yeah, go ahead. They want to do that, yeah, 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 go ahead, no problem. That's not also what I'm trying to say about relating with them. Also, sometimes we think that in order for us to relate with them, we have to sponsor them in all the expenses and spoil them with gift. Oh, they want to have a game, oh, we buy for them. They want to have toys, we buy for them. They want to have decoration, we buy for them. No, not, not necessary. We don't have to buy everything for them to relate with them. But all that they need from us is this is that they just need to be comfortable around us. That's all. All that they need is that they can feel very comfortable around us. They don't need us to spoil them with food, with toys, with games, with sponsoring them in everything. No. They don't need us to, to play with them, dress like them, joining TikTok or even eat their food. But what they need is that they just need to feel very comfortable around us. That they will find that, hey, around this man, around this uncle, around this auntie, around this pastor, I feel very comfortable. I can just say whatever I say and knowing that I'm comfortable around him or her. And that is the thing when I mention about relatable to our young people. Because once they know who they are, and once they know that they can belong to us, they will find their purpose. Because this is the studies that had been done by Fuller Youth Institute Research. They have studied and conducted these studies among 500 youth groups. And their question is simple. They ask, what type of activities do you think is needed more for the youth? And they list out 15 type of activities that they think the youth are interested in and guess the three the first top three number one it's time for deep conversation about current social issues that is their main interest and this is our these are young people and oftentimes we think what they they want to have more in their youth activities is more eating more games no Top one, the number one answer was time for deep conversation about current social issues. They want us to talk about the reality of the world. They want us to talk about the condition of the world. They want us to talk about what's happening right now, right here, right now. Number two is mission trip. They wish that the church will have more mission trip. And number three, interestingly enough, the study shows that the the third one is community service projects. They wish that the youth can have more community service projects. And guess, having more games is late, uh, it's, it's fall under which category? According to the studies, having more games is the last on the list of, all of, of the survey that they have sent out to all these youth. Our young people do not need more games. They do not need more fun things. They do not need more just having fun and hang around because why? The world out there can provide a better games than what the church can give. Why? Because sometimes in church, our games are so restricted. Cannot do this, cannot do that, cannot have boys and girls together, cannot have... They, they, they don't want to have games anymore in church. But what they want is for us to dare to 
to have a deep conversation about what's happening in the world today. What's happening with the poverty in many of these countries? And what will the church do to deal with those poverty, with abuse that happen, with all those problems that are happening across the world, with all the racial issues that are happening in different parts of the world? They want to know where we stand as a church. They want to extend the love of God through mission trips. They want to serve their community. And so it is interesting to know that in their heart, in their mind, their question is, how can Jesus be manifested in the world that I live today? That is the question that they want us to answer. Beyond the Sabbath school lesson, sermon, and activities that I have in church. So I have studied all this Sabbath school lesson. How does that lesson will impact me in the way I see myself in the community. How can Jesus be manifested in the world that I live today? This is the question that many of these young people were asking. Because I have tell you a, sort, a simple story. For those of us who had been um, aware, for those of us who are living in Singapore, basically, you know that there was a stage in the circuit breaker and probably one of the reasons why we have to enter into circuit breaker because the increase of the infection rate among many of the migrant workers in the dormitory and I have to tell you this interesting event that didn't happen and probably many of us in church are not aware of on the fourth day when we entered into the circuit breaker one of the young adults of our church actually texted me and said, Pastor, what can we do for these migrant workers? Now, these young adults who sent me these messages, they are the one that you may see in church, looks no interest, have no, seems to have no interest in church, in activities, in whatsoever. You will notice that they are the one that will sit in some spot of our church pew, and they will be busy with their phone. And yet, on, at the moment where this crisis happened in many of these migrant worker dormitories across Singapore, they were the first one who texted me and said, that, Pastor, we need to do something about this. And so they gathered all the young adults of their group and they have donated quite a, in, um, quite a significant help through one of the NGO to help some of our migrant workers out there without asking the church for budget, without asking board approval, without writing any proposal. They just stood up, they said we need to do something, and they did it. And yet sometimes you may see them only in church as these rebellious people who don't even listen to the sermon of the pastor. But I have to tell you today, this is our own young adults. I'm not talking about young adults of other churches, but this is our own young adults who sit with us in this church during the time when we still have life, uh, when we still have our physical service over here, that they are aware of the situation and they have extended the love of Jesus to some of them, even without the knowledge of many of us in church. I just would like to tell you, church, that your young adults, our young people, they are not fully ignorant and careless about the church and what the church should do for people around us. They are actually are trying to extend the knowledge of Jesus that they have learned in a way that may be not necessarily the same with us, but they did it anyway. And so you may say, so pastors, what's your point? You have explained to us all this long explanation, what's your point? And I just like to bring us to the book of Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 to 14. In this story that we have, that we have heard the special song just now, very beautiful special song, we have heard what did Jesus do when his disciples tried to move away all these children that were brought to him. In the time of Jesus, such tradition is that parents 
will bring their children to a specific rabbi or a respected man to receive a blessing from him. But for the, in the eyes of the disciples of Jesus that day, for them, they think that this is a problem. The, the disciples see the little children or the younger generation in general as a nuisance. They're insignificant. They're a source of problem. They're a waste of time. Jesus has something more important to do. Jesus needs to preach. Jesus needs to do all these things. And all these young children and their parents is a problem and they, out of their good intention, wants to spare Jesus from having to deal with this issue. And so they push them away and say that, oh, you young people, you don't understand adult problem. You are not mature enough to know what you need to do. And all these things. And so they, was, they were pushed away. But then Jesus said this, that let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Now the question is, if the kingdom of heaven belongs to this young gener younger generation, does it mean if we shun them away, we ourselves will not see the kingdom of heaven, aren't we? That we will not be able to understand what is the kingdom of heaven is all about. And so there are more questions that we need to ask. Because it was not strangers who stopped the children from coming to Jesus. Instead, it was Jesus' own disciples, his own inner circle, who pushed them away. Now, I'm not trying to say that the world will not be able to attract our young people to leave the church. But is it just possible, is it possible that we who claim to be the inner circle of Jesus, the church, the people who serve our Master and our Lord, we are the one that had pushed our younger generation away from Jesus. That out of our good intention, or probably out of our own concern, we have pushed them away and say that you are not that important, you are not that significant, you are not ready yet to be around Jesus. Probably today we need to start to think and look back. Are we really have extended the love and the kindness of Jesus to them? Now today I'm not speaking and you may say, Oh pastor, your 30 minute sermon huh, from the beginning until the end, youth, 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 everything is youth. Are you trying to be a youth advocate? Honestly, no. Because what I have in mind is this. I personally believe that our younger generation is the key to our survival. I have received more and more requests from many of us that said, Pastor, can you find someone else to serve in this ministry? I've been serving in this ministry for more than 20 years, you know. Can you find someone else? And not only one person said that to me. There are so many of our Ministry leaders right now saying the same thing. Pastor, can you find someone else? I've been serving in this capacity for so many years. Please, come on, not another year. Come on, so many years already. And you and I know the answer. That our younger generation will need to take this position from us and start to lead this church. But the problem is this. We often come with this assumption that we can just throw the homework to them, tell them to do and they say, yes sir, I will go and do it. No! This is no longer the generation where they just listen and obey to us simply because we are more senior than them. And for me, the key that this regeneration can happen can only happen when we start to relate to them personally. When we start to open up and we start to say that, hey, I'm willing to be more in relationship with you. Because if you expect me and Pastor Chen Rong to be the only two pastors that will relate with all the young people in this church, believe me, we will not go anywhere. Because the work of reaching out to our young people is the work of the whole church. It is the work of you and it is the work of me. And so I would like to make this personal appeal to all of us this morning. 
let us start to make a change in our church. Let us start to open up and to be relatable to them. Let us welcome them and say that, hey, this is our church together. And with you right now, I believe Eunice has sent it out because the second feedback that I had is that, Pastor, your previous sermon was very appealing, but you don't have action plan. So after we listen to you, we don't know what to do. So I hope that Eunice has sent the document to you through the broadcast WhatsApp. I would like you to look at it. And from today's onward, let us make it a goal for our church that we will start to make all the eight points in that document as our action. That we will make it something that we will intentionally do to our young people. Because this is about the survival of this church. This is about whether we are going to continue to have more and more people in this church. Whether we are going to continue to see growth in this church. I believe that if we practice the biblical mandate of Jesus Christ, that instead of shunning them away, we welcome them, allow them to come to Jesus and welcome them to the presence of their Lord and their Savior. We will see growth, we will see revival, and we will see something that is going to happen in our church. For those of us who had served this year, the church all these years, I know that you are very tired. And as a pastor, I don't think it's right for me to continue to force you to continue to serve in this church for more years. But in order for our young people to be willing to start to take responsibility and ownership of leadership in this church, let us open our heart and let us be more, empath uh, uh, more relatable to them that they will find that everyone in this church is their family members, that they are willing to serve their own family. So I bring all this message with a simple hope that this is not about being a youth advocate, but this is for the sake of our church, continue to exist for the next years to come, that we will find regeneration really going to happen. There is no other way other than we start to extend a loving arms to all of our young people in this church. So I would like to invite you to look upon the document that Eunice has sent. If she is not sending it to you, please text her and so she will be able to text you the document. Let's make all the action plan written there to be the goal that we will have at least for the next quarter that we have over here in church. So church, I personally believe that in the heart of Jesus, there will always be a place for us, including for our young people. Let us make that place available for them. Let's make that place open for them. And let us extend our love in the way that Jesus has shown his disciple. That instead of shunning them away, welcome them, allow them to be themselves, and they will finally find Jesus is really real for their, for their life. Let us pray. May the blessing of our Father will be with us. And may the grace that he has bestowed upon us through Jesus Christ, his Son, will be the power that will save us. And may the fellowship with the Holy Spirit will allow us to walk day by day until the day Jesus comes again. For this prayer we have put in his name, Jesus Christ. Amen.